Hello everybody, welcome back to the James Lawrence Allcott channel. I hope you guys are all doing very well. Really excited about this video because one of my good, good friends, good, good friends, is finally coming back on the channel. I think the first time Rory was on the channel, I think I was on about like three or four K or something like that back in the day. And, uh, and now we're both doing all right, mate. We're both getting there. Um, so uh, Rory, we're going to be talking about your, your dream team. That's what this whole thing is going to be. We're going to try and get different people on just to chat through the players that meant something to them. Not a Chelsea 11, not, it doesn't have to be specific to their, their club. It's just about players that, that mattered to them. Putting this team together, it was so difficult. It was. It sounds like it's something that should be so easy. You know, you just pick your 11, but there are so many players that mean so much that I've actually had to leave out because it, it, you're really affected, aren't you, by football when you're young? You get into a situation, don't you, where you think, well, I can't possibly not have this person. But then also, I can't possibly not have <laughs> this person as well. Right. And you're like, well, I can't have both because also, you know, I want to create a good team here. Who's a player that you're devastated isn't in your 11? It's Dennis Wise, Mark Steen and John Spencer. All part <laughs> of the same, all part of the same team at Chelsea. All mean so much to me. In fact, I met Mark Steen mm. in Waitrose fairly recently and I was so starstruck. I, it, like genuinely. Mate. I was so starstruck. Yeah. Because like in my life I've been fortunate. Firstly, I've met like footballers, but like in my old job, I interviewed Britney Spears. I didn't care. Yeah. I saw Mark Steen. I saw Mark <laughs> Steen buying avocados and I was like, oh my god. God. That was amazing. Oh it's God. that so weird how that happens. I remember I, I was a I was a runner back in the day. So me and Rory both used to work in in telly, and so you meet a lot of these sort of showbiz people. And you know, as a runner, you've got to go and get someone to and take them to a, a dressing room a lot of the time. And I, I had to do is yeah, like you say, all those names you can imagine. But I remember um, I had to pick up Sir Clive Lloyd, and I was just thinking, yeah. what? Because these these people are superheroes to us. I think sportsmen, it's for me personally, it's a different level to like, oh, what, you can sing well? Great. Like, for, yeah. for, for players that mean something to you, it's a different level. It is a different level. Totally. Totally. Mark Steen had an impact on my life. Like, Mark Steen stopped Chelsea being relegated when mm. I was young. His goals, he arrived, we signed him from Stoke. His goals kept Chelsea in the league. Yeah. That means so much more to me than Lady Gaga or Justin Timberlake, who were both on the show. I don't care about either of them. Whereas Mark Steen had a profound impact on my life. So the fact that he's not in, Dennis Wise isn't in, and John Spencer's not in. It's tough. I don't really I don't really know who I am anymore because it shows, <laughs> it, how, yeah. it shows how good this team is for those players to be left out. But there's layers of life that get in the way of an eleven as well. And I think your your eleven when you're when you're twenty will be very different to your eleven when you're when you're, you know, thirty five or whatever it might be. And yeah, that that those three players because well, that's a Chelsea that um that people remember as being a very short team. And so that's I think yes. maybe another thing I wonder if you're <laughs> which, like Which I love. Yeah, would you Absolutely. love that? I knew you might. I thought you <laughs> might. I I yeah, it's that. the most. It was the most diminutive eleven mm. ever, ever. Like the, I think the tallest, the tallest player in our team was about sort of five Probably foot Glenn eleven. Glenn Hoddle at the back, wasn't it? That yeah, was about exactly. it, really. And then, and then, yeah, yeah, yeah. the ninety, the ninety four FA Cup final team. Gavin Peacock played a huge part in it as well. Mm -hmm. All, all sub five foot ten. Amazing. Yeah, well, all, all sub five foot nine, I think, mate. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, all tiny guys. Um, so right, let's dive into this team then. Let's start off obviously in the right place, which is the goalkeeper. And uh, yeah, love this, love this call. Go for it, mate. Well, I've gone for Chilavert simply because when I was a kid, goalkeepers didn't. You know, now goalkeepers are kind of famed for their passing ability, and and it's a quality that certain managers look for when signing a keeper. And on to a level, we kind of expect our goalkeepers to be able to contribute assists. That wasn't that wasn't what it was like when yeah. we were kids. Like that wasn't what, Steve Grizovich. Nobody <laughs> knows whether he had a good, good distribution or not because it wasn't really what his job was. Yeah, you know, goal, the goal distribution has evolved so much. However, there was one exception to this rule: Schillerver, exotic name, glorious, scored goals, scored free kicks, scored penalties, scored so many. Mm. And obviously, as a kid, hearing about this guy, it was it was a fable, wasn't it? He yeah. was like, this is the most glamorous thing. He's he's from where? And he does what? <laughs> Para what? Like, this, this is dumb. He does what? Yeah. Um, and it kind of just put a glamour into a position where I didn't think there was any glamour. Mm. And he will forever be that that goalkeeper for me. Do you know, and interesting, I don't know if he's a very good goalie or not. Well, this is what, this is interesting. It's kind of right? irrelevant though. So for all of these guys, I've got together their sort of their, their, their stats in terms of their sort of games and, and, and goals, which is obviously important for, for this goalkeeper, which is a strange sentence to say. But so in 1982 to 1984, we played for Sportivo 
Laqueno, I think it is. And uh, 67 games. So even in his first team, the first club he played for, 67 games, four goals. So so he was like, he was getting that, you know, he, it wasn't like it was like, okay, uh, uh, what, is no one going to take the penalty? Well, I'll have it. I'll take it. And, and, you know, later down the line. But then he went to a couple of teams and I think it was partly down to probably the management of those teams that he had the opportunity or didn't have the opportunity because the next two clubs he played for, Guarani and San Lorenzo, he played 122 games, 19 games, got one goal for Guarani, but no goals for San Lorenzo. One goal for Real Zaragoza, which I wonder if that's a free kick or a, or a penalty. But it was, it was Velez Sarsfeld. That was the club where the oh, goals started happened. to rain down. Yeah, so that's from 1991 to 2001, which obviously is his, the main part of his era. 236 games, 36 goals. Uh, so he, and the big thing with him is obviously it was free kicks. It wasn't just penalties because I think sometimes you see, I think there's a goalkeeper called uh, Seni for Sao Paulo who's got the most goals from a from a goalkeeper, but it was mainly penalties, I think, with him. I might be wrong with that. But with Schillever, it was these beautiful free kicks. He was the first player to take a free kick, a goalkeeper to take a direct free kick in a World Cup. Did it in 1998. Yeah. And, uh, and it, yeah, just exactly the kind of romanticism that you kind of want of this player that we didn't really see him play that much. You're only waiting until no. the World Cup for it to happen. And that's it. You, I think that was the other thing with, with those kind of World Cups. And I think you still feel it a little bit, but probably less so. In those kind of World Cups for us back then, you're waiting and going, oh, I've heard about this goalkeeper who plays for Paraguay and I want to see him in the World Cup, right? Yes. Well, it got to the stage, actually, when you when you were that young, you kind of start thinking, I really want Paraguay to do well. Like, I want England to play Paraguay. You kind of form a bit of a soft spot for a country mm. where you have no affiliation at all, simply because of the stories of this r remarkable goalkeeper. Yeah. And, and it, it leaves a mark. It leaves a mark on you, those kind of stories. They mean something, don't they? They do, yeah, and I think that's what that is what it's about a lot of the time uh, with with different goalkeepers and goalkeeper in particular. You want that little bit of eccentricity. The big stat I remember on him, I remember in 1998, there was I don't know if it was Watsits or certain crisps. You got these like coins or cards or something, and they had like a fact on the back, and one was like Roberto Carlos had 52 inch diameter thighs or something like that. That was one, but the other one I remember <laughs> always seeing was uh, Schilliver had size six feet. Really? Same as me. <laughs> there you go, maybe that's it. And that's why we've got a kinship. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Just when I thought I couldn't love him anymore. <laughs> He's got tiny feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Schilliver, great shout for the first one. Let's go to, to left back. Someone probably not as as loved. <laughs> uh, who's your left, left back choice? I've gone for Ashley Cole. I mm. think that he is truly, you know, when you think about English players, over the years, I think we bandied the term world class around fairly liberally, fairly incorrectly. But I think that Ashley Cole is the one of the only genuinely world class players that we that we have had. I think that like, Ashley Cole, you know, people when you think about the best left backs in the world ever, the only contender is to, to rival Ashley Cole is Paolo Maldini, and Maldini is. It, you know, it was longevity and whatever. I think on his day, both playing at their absolute peak, I think that Ashley Cole was was a better player. And if you were to do a world eleven of all time greatest players ever, I think Ashley Cole may be the only England player to actually make it. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. If you look at that golden generation, um, he was probably yeah. the only one who didn't sort of. You know, you can go. He didn't really let us down here. You know, he kept Ronaldo in his pocket on a, a number of occasions. Um, in the, yeah. in during those years, how do you feel about the the Cashley thing? This sort of the backlash to him moving to Chelsea. How did you th how did you feel about it then? And how do you feel, think it's sort of aged? Because I feel like it's aged quite badly in terms of the sort of the venom that was shown towards it. Yeah, well, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, Ashley Cole made some mistakes. He got certain things wrong, and and there was a qu the quote, the famous quote that will forever haunt Ashley Cole mm. is the one from his book. You know, the one where he says about swerving off the road. He read that he was offered, I think he was offered £50,000 a yeah. week. And he was so offended at that offer that he swerved off the road. It's very difficult to make a justification for that. However, I will try. In his world, he was the best at what he did. He was being offered a third of the wages that were being offered to his peers at the time. Yeah. And he therefore found it offensive. 
it doesn't sit comfortably because whatever spin you put on it, fifty thousand pounds is an incredible amount of money to earn a year, let alone you know, let alone a week. Yeah. So that that doesn't sit comfortably, but. What I've tried to do here is just analyse like the footballer and what he did for Chelsea. You've got to remember, there was a time when William Gallas, at the, at the time, William Gallas went the other way and Chelsea paid £5 million. There was a school of thought that suggested that Arsenal had got the better deal. That, that was a fair assumption at the time. £5 million quid and Gallas. <laughs> and we've got Clichy coming through. Mm. You know, that was the... That was, that was suggested by Arsenal fans, but that was proved to be so incorrect and the way that Ashley Cole helped elevate Chelsea his performance in the European Cup final the quote my favourite quote perhaps of all time is when he was asked at the on the pitch in the Allianz Arena Germans don't lose on penalties and he, his reply was they do now <laughs> uh, and he scored and, and I think that people don't like him mm. and therefore they let that cloud their judgement on him as a player yeah, I think that's a really good point. He was remarkable. He was absolutely remarkable. And like I say, I don't. If you were to do a world eleven of players, say, say, even if you did it like Premier League era, so that we haven't got, you know, it's very difficult for me to make a judgment on Pele, for example. Yeah, yeah sure. But if, if Premier League era, world eleven of of, of uh, people that we can think of, I think Ashley Cole is the only English player to make it into that. And for that reason alone, the fact that he did it at my club, the fact that he won a European Cup. Uh, the fact that he played so brilliantly for England consistently. Do you remember when he took never taken a professional penalty before in his life I didn't uh, know when against he took Portugal? That one. No, no. The, what, this is before against uh, in Portugal. Do you remember when England were knocked out by Portugal? Yeah, 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 yeah. He'd never taken actually Cole that day had never taken a professional penalty. He stepped up and their goalkeeper was doing all like funny business. Do you remember he yeah, took his he gloves, took his gloves off, off, and all off that? Wound me up. Isn't that mad? I was just taking your gloves yeah. off and wind you up yeah. so much. Yeah. Ashley Cole never taken a penalty before like wallops it in. He was he was a man for the big stage, an outrageously good player, and somebody who I think history will be a lot more kind to than perhaps the current era. And for that reason he's in. I love I love him. I genuinely love him. So sticking with Chelsea that. and a and a player that I yeah, you, you tell you tell me about him and then I'll tell you what are my memories of him. This this signing for this no signing has ever happened at Chelsea that has made me more excited. When I read that this player was going to arrive at Stamford Bridge, I couldn't process. I couldn't process it. It was it was unbelievable. And I'm of course talking about Rud Hullet. Mm. Chelsea. Glenn Hoddle became our manager, taking over from Ian Porterfield. You know, very unglamorous, a very unglamorous Chelsea team. You know, it wasn't that long ago that the midfield was Joe Jones and Vinnie Jones and whoever. You know, wasn't a good side. Glenn Hoddle came in changed things a bit. We got to an FA Cup final, got a little bit more glamorous. And all of a sudden, we signed two players in the same summer. But Rude Hullet was one of them. The other one, by the way, was a, a, an amazing player for Chelsea. Mark Hughes, fantastic player. And deserves a mention here as well, actually. I know you hold him in less high regard than I do. But, yeah, yeah, that's um, a different thing. Yeah, but Chelsea signed Mark Hughes and Rude Hullet. And when Rude Hullet arrived, the entire atmosphere of the club changed. It genuinely did. People could not process it. The Fulham, the Fulham Road was full of people wearing uh, sort of dreadlock wigs. Right. It was, it was an amazing experience. And actually, from that signing, from the Rude Hullet era, Chelsea have never really looked back. Yeah. He was the player. Like suddenly, Chelsea, Chelsea went from signing we, like we signed Paul Furlong, right, for two point three million pounds I mean, from what <laughs> from Watford. Who don't you know? Yeah. Very good player. But we that that was the, that was who we were signing. Mm. That was the excitement. I mean, that was what. You know, it was Furlong from it was Furlong from Watford. It was Steen from Stoke. It was Petrescu from Sheffield Wednesday, who will come on to. But it was it was that level. Yeah. All of a sudden, we were signing a Ballon d'Or winner. Yeah. We were signing a man who has won the European Cup. You know, in '88, won the uh, European Championships with Holland. Well, yeah, World Soccer Player of the Year twice, '87 and '89. Yeah. Ballon d'Or in '87 as well. Unbelievable. Yeah. AC Milan, that AC Milan team, right? Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And he, when he arrived at Chelsea, the, the, the culture of the club changed. It was, we were suddenly a serious proposition. And he was so good. He was so much better than everyone else in that team. He had to play sweeper. Yeah. He had to play sweeper. Well, that's what, which that's... is equivalent to what happens with like our level of football, isn't it? You know, if we play five a side, <laughs> yeah. you know, when someone really good arrives, mm. you're like, oh, mate, do you want to just play at the back? Because otherwise it's not a contest. 
Yeah, well, I mean, so th that's what I wanted to say about him. Was when I th when I think about Rude Hillett, Hull Hullet, sorry, I remember being so confused about watching him play. I think I remember uh, it might have been a, I don't know if it was a cup semi final maybe at Villa Park. I think you lost it to to Man, Man United. United. Man United. Yeah. Craig yeah. Burley messed up. Craig Burley. David that's Beckham it. scored. Yeah, that's David it. David Beckham scored. David Beckham scored. Of course, yeah. Before he was, you know, had that number seven on his back. Uh, and Rude Hullet in that game. I don't know if he scored a goal, but he. I remember he just he did score a goal. That's it. It might have been a header or something. Anyway, yes. in the he in that game. And actually, I did add a little look this morning as well. I had a little to search Rude Hullet because I, I wanted to remember if it was the same. Because I knew, like you say, he played as a sweeper. But if you watch some clips on YouTube, he just, it, it's really confusing for people that understand football was 4-4-2, as you did at the time. Because he would play there and then dart forward to either a tackle someone, almost like a defensive midfielder who's sitting back, or he get the ball and just drive with it. And he's kind of, he's, then he's, he's in areas where you should, hang on, Rude Hillis, what's he doing there? He shouldn't be in those areas of the pitch driving with the ball. Or the other centre-back would have the ball and he'd just go on a run. Like, go, oh, I'm going yeah. out then. And it's just like, yeah. it is, it was, it felt like watching Sunday League football because he was that dominant, both in his quality, but his... His physicality as well, which was probably on the wane. You know, the fact that he's, you know, he was playing for, for AC Milan up until 1994, went to Sampdoria after that and didn't do as well. You know, he was at the back end of his career, but he seemed like he was physically just so much more imposing than any other player. It was unbelievable. Yeah, he was he was so good. And I think what's what kind of happens at Chelsea uh, when you think about the eras, they're seen as very different. So there's one era that is seen as being, uh, as, you know, Zola, Di Matteo, yeah. a, like a good Chelsea, Torre Andre Flo, like a good Chelsea team. And then there's another era that's kind of seen as being Jacob Yelberg, Eddie Newton, Craig Burley, Terry Phelan. They're seen mm. as being very separate eras, but they weren't. Yeah. Like Ruth Hullet, Ruth Hullet would have played in a team with David Hopkin. <laughs> you know, it doesn't quite make, it doesn't quite make sense. And there were times actually, it was very it was very entertaining because there were times when Rude Hullet would look like he'd made a wrong pass. You know, because like basically nobody was nobody on was level. on his level. Yeah. You know, he's he's linking up with he's linking up with the likes of, you know, like and Andy Dave Myers. Hopkin. <laughs> yeah, Andy Myers, Gareth Hall. I mean, we had I think we had Graham Ricks playing and you know, at the back end of his career. Craig Burley, Darren Barnard, these players were just they, they they were amazed mm. that they were playing with Rude Hullet. Like imagine imagine Frank Sinclair and Rude Hullet playing a one two. That, that's wild, isn't it? Like completely wild. How did you feel about how his managerial career tailed off? Were you surprised by that? Were you disappointed by that? The Newcastle thing felt like it was he was the problem more so than than anything else. Or certainly that's how it's kind of been portrayed a little bit. Were you surprised by that? Yeah, I mean, to a degree. I think I think what happened at Newcastle, if I remember rightly, he basically fell out with Shearer, didn't he? Do you yeah. Remember, he dropped Shearer and Ferguson from the same team. Yeah, for the Sunderland which, derby. Yes, there's. If you then don't win the game, even if you do win it, I think I don't, I don't even remember what the score was, but presumably he didn't win it. There are certain clubs where you can't pick an argument with certain players, obviously, and for, because of their achievements there. So the way it went at Newcastle, you know. It, it, it was it was circumstance, I think, rather than a reflection of his of his managerial capacity. Mm. But you've got to remember, Ruth Hullet at Chelsea, he led Chelsea as manager. He's he was I think he's the first black manager to win uh, any major silverware in this country at Chelsea. Mm. He led Chelsea to our first major trophy or first trophy at all, in fact, for twenty five years. Chelsea won a European trophy in nineteen seventy one. We then went 25 years until 1997, mm. until 26. we win an, to, until 26, yeah, mm. uh, until we win another trophy. Um, 25, yeah, yeah, 26 years. Um, and as a result, Rud Hullet has changed Chelsea forever. You know, mm. Rud Hullet led Chelsea out at Wembley, having played brilliantly for us, by the way. He then led Chelsea out at Wembley. Di Matteo scores after 42 seconds, and history is made. Mm. This uh, Rud Hullet has shaped and and been significantly responsible for the club that Chelsea are today. Yeah. And for, for that reason, 
I will love him forever. And I think those pockets, so th- those years, I would say 95 to 98 for, for a lot of clubs, or specifically Chelsea, um, the use of foreign players and, the, and, and getting that right was the difference between, between Crystal Palace and a few players that they signed and Spurs and some of the players that they signed. And and yeah. and Chelsea, who went on to become the club that they are are now. So Rude Hullet did straddle those those years and dragged dragged the squad from one place to another place. Well, let's stick with Chelsea for a little bit. We'll give you another centre back in a second. Um, but I think we need to stick with Chelsea because another one of those players who came in that era as a player started at Steaua Bucharest. A lot of people forget they played in the Champions League final in 1989 for them. Then went to uh, Italy for a couple of years. Foggia, uh, Genoa. Then to the Premier League with Sheffield Wednesday and then made his way to, to Chelsea. 152 games, 17 goals. Dan Petrescu, Rory, popped in, in yeah. there. Why is that? An am- he's an amazing, he's an amazing player. He's an absolutely a fantastic player. He was our record signing. He was our transfer record signing. I think he signed for about two and a half million quid uh, from Sheffield Wednesday. And the way that he played as a right back, it was so, uh, so ahead of its time. Mm. He played as a right back in the way that, say, Trent Alexander-Arnold plays as a right back now. But that isn't what was going on. That isn't what happened then. Uh, he was so good for a goal. Such an intelligent football player. Uh, and he used, to, he used to do it all so easily, mm. Dan Petrescu. He used to, you know, he was a right back. He very rarely had to make a tackle because he was always in the right place. Scored huge goals for us and was part of our, part of our winning culture. It was at the time, Chelsea became the first ever club to put out an all-foreign 11. And, uh, and he was just... You know when we were talking before, and it's players that leave a mark on you. Some of the goals that he scored for Chelsea, but also, do you remember the Romanian team? <laughs> Not yet. When yeah, they all went, yeah, yeah. when they all went blonde, mm. like that Romanian team, all bleaching their hair blonde. Mm. That's just fantastic, man. Like, I loved it. I loved it so much. And there was a Chelsea player there who was brilliant, who contributed massively. Mm. I remember when England went out, I was a bit like. Yeah, a bit of guy, but Romania are wicked. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got blonde hair, and, and it was Dan Petrescu, and you know, yeah, Hadji, uh, players like that. Wow. Yeah, but no, that was that was a real moment, and that that France that France World Cup was the one f- that was the one for me, I think, where it kind of took me. I, the, my only recollection of of '94 was my dad being over the moon. Ray Houghton scored against scored for Ireland against Italy, mm. and I remember my dad didn't come home for about three days. Really. But, <laughs> Apart from that, that was like that's literally my only my only memory from the time. I've looked back and I have like a romanticism around that World mm-hmm. Cup, but that's as an adult watching it rather than being part of it. Whereas yeah. the the France one, I was very much part of the World Cup. The final thing I noticed about Dan Petrescu because I did wonder about him and his position because he was such an attacking fullback. Is when I looked back at that 1997. Um, victory against Middlesbrough, that FA Cup, such a such a huge game. The midfield has Dan Petrescu in it. It's a very strange midfield that has Dan Petrescu is on the right wing, supposedly. Um, then Eddie Newton, um, Di Matteo and Dennis Wise on the left wing. So he probably offered a lot of width in that. So the, the flexibility it, it, of that, was, that was very rare at the time. It was the overlapping. It was, it was uh, you know, the way that Beckham and Neville would just overlap. Hmm. And oh, and at some points Beckham would end up as the fullback as Neville was the most advanced player. Yeah, it was a little bit like that that Chelsea side. They mm. would they would interchange. It was a very, it was this you know it was it was Rude Hullet's Chelsea. There was a lot going on. It was <laughs> there was a <laughs> lot a of lot free stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I mean like Dennis Wise playing left wing. I, I know he did it for Wimbledon way back in the day, but that was prehistoric football yeah. really at the time. He was I I thought of him as a you know as that centre midfielder who got on the ball. But, and I'm sure he did that, but he did it from that left wing position, which was interesting. Yeah. I can't believe, do you know what, as you just mentioned him there, I can't believe that Dennis Wise isn't in there. I kind of feel like I need to, mm. I might have to make a substitution. <laughs> really? Well, yeah, there's, wow. we'll, we'll discuss it. Okay. We'll discuss it. I'm, I'm going to have to make a last minute substitution last minute because as we, as we have this nostalgic chat, Let's see how Dennis it floats Wise can't up. not be in my team. Let's see how yeah. it floats up because I think that, that has to be the gut call all the time. Let's finish yeah. off with centre-back and I'm delighted you've put this this player in here. Uh, one of my heroes uh, as, a, as a kid, uh, Stuart Pearce, uh, the, the electrician. I've had to put him as a centre-half. Yeah. yeah, I've had to put him as a centre-half. Um, look, it's the redemption, isn't it? It's yeah. the redemption. The yeah. miss, the miss is again, the miss in Italy, and the redemption against Spain. It, it, I've, the, the passion that was displayed there. Mm. I remember watching it as a kid, thinking, "Wow, this guy's crazy." 
Mm. And, you know, we like to see that. I think that particularly, particularly now in an era where football has become so sanitised, so overly sanitised, you know, players are PR'd. It's difficult to get any kind of emotion out of anyone. People, players are, players are, are attacked if they celebrate scoring a goal against a, a former team. Mm. It, it's crazy to me. We are, we are suppressing all natural emotion from the game. Yeah. And that was something that you could not do to Stuart Pearce. And no. the, just the raw... The raw emotion on display when he scored that goal. Mm. It's it's a moment in my life and a moment I will never forget. That's and therefore, he's in this team. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, the thing as well with Stuart Pearce, I think that what adds to it is both both the explosion of emotion, of of relief, of, of relief, you know, more than anything. And he'll, he'll say what he wants, but he just wanted it and he deserved it. And and the, and the big thing for me as well was was the character of Stuart Pearce because Stuart Pearce was a little bit different to other players. You know, Stuart Pearce didn't celebrate when he scored goals. Actually, you know, ironically, um, he would sort of score thunderbolts and stand there. If you go and watch the the FA Cup final against uh, Spurs, he scores a thunderbolt of a, a set piece and then doesn't really celebrate. It kind of wasn't in his in his nature, and he'd got on with what had happened with missing that penalty, and just sort of quietly kind of. Held it in, and you knew he was holding it in. I think, obviously, it's easy to say it now. So when the, he walks up for that penalty, and you're like, "Oh no, please, like oh, anything, just don't, please don't miss it," and yeah. he puts it away, and he takes a second to go, "Am I going to hold it in?" And he goes, "No, I'm not." Bah! Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. It's That's what it's about, man. That is what. But it's do you about. know? Do you know what? There are certain players that. Like I love that kind of celebration from anyone. Like I don't know enough about this player. I don't know. I don't know who he even played for. But one of my favourite celebrations. I always say it on Twitter. I'll always go. You know, if that good news happens, I'll always go. I'm currently doing the Marco Tardelli celebration around my front room because Marco Tardelli scored a goal for Italy and did the same thing. Yeah. Just goes, just running like going crazy. Yeah. Man. And I love those explosions of emotion. I love it because for me the game is about that. And it's yeah. sad, I think. VAR's killing it, but also fans are killing it. Fans get fans get angry when players celebrate. Like, what's going on? Yeah, man. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, unbelievable career as well. You know, came through from non-league to go to Coventry. Played for Coventry, so made his league debut in 1983. Played his last game for Man City in 2002. <laughs> oh. Just kept oh. playing. Just kept playing. Just kept going. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable England career as well, 78 caps for, for And them a brilliant well. manager as well. Not everybody would have the vision to put David James up front. <laughs> yeah, before <laughs> his time. That was a bit, that was, I struggled with that a little bit because he was just like this like heavy metal <laughs> nutter, right? And then he goes and be the manager, he goes, well, let's be nice to the refs. Let's, let's, yeah. let's be forward thinking of what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, very, yeah, <laughs> interesting dude. Really interesting dude. Really good autobiography actually as well, if anyone that needs a good read. Uh, right, we move into midfield. You've got some decisions to make here because there's, yeah. I think, look, we're going 4-4-2, aren't we? So I think you've yeah. got, you've got, uh, there is a Chelsea player in here, but uh, have you figured out, are you trying to get Dennis in this team or not? Yeah, I am. I are know, I know the substitution. For... Okay, go on, I'm make drop... yourself. It's... I'm gonna. What I'm gonna have to do is just to let everybody know. In my team initially was Trevor Sinclair, and the reason no! is when I think about <laughs> when I think about moments, when I think about moments that happened in my football life, the best goal I've ever seen was Trevor Sinclair's goal, yeah. and therefore I felt like he had to be in just simply as a meritocracy. He has to be there because it's the best goal I've ever seen scored. It was for James QPR against Barnsley. James was in yeah. the stadium, yeah, man. So it was. It was slightly. It was slightly. For James, but it was also because it is the best goal I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. However, discussing it with you, I'm making a last minute tactical change. I, I respect Trevor Sinclair that. is out, Dennis Wise is in. Dennis Wise is in. Okay, uh, and Dennis Wise is in because. Dennis Wise is in because it, he was Chelsea. Uh, he was the Chelsea that I grew up with, personified. He uh, totally encapsulated the club. He did that incredible thing that basically nobody could do as, as it changed. As Chelsea changed and went from a very average, below average side, mm. Gavin Peacock moved on, John Spencer moved on, uh, Paul Furlong moved on, everybody left and they were replaced by Glamour. The only player who managed to reimagine himself as a, from a winger to a central midfielder and made himself completely indispensable to the team. Gianluca Vialli arrived at Chelsea, his best mate was Dennis Wise. Dennis Wise was captain of a Chelsea team, including Roberto Di Matteo and uh, Gianfranco Zola. Mm. 
he became totally undroppable because of his performances on the pitch. He kept like Chelsea signed Didier Deschamps, the captain of the World Cup winners. Deschamps lasted a year. He played well. He played alongside Wise, but he only lasted a year because he couldn't really displace Dennis Wise, mm. and he wasn't really good at not being the captain of the team. So Dennis Wise, in terms of what he achieved with Chelsea, the trophy hall, uh, the way that he embodied two eras, uh, and what what people overlook with Wise, and I find it quite frustrating. He was a glorious football player. You know, he scored a goal in the San Siro, which is one of the best goals that Chelsea will... One of the most recognised goals. You know, we will sing about Dennis Wise scoring in the San Siro forever. You know, my grandkids will sing, oh, Dennis Wise. Because that goal meant so much. We went to the San Siro in 1999, which is another thing that actually is good to talk about because people always think of Chelsea post-Abramovich. Chelsea and where would you be without the money? Mm. Uh, your, your Man City, all that. You know, when Man City were in Division 2, Chelsea were playing in the San Siro. You know, it's not the same. And Dennis Wise scored. We drew one all out there. And it, against AC Milan of the 90s as well, by the way. Mm. And I think that just what Dennis Wise did for Chelsea, he, he actually is one of Chelsea. He, Dennis Wise would probably be in a Chelsea all-time greatest eleven, So he certainly has to be in. Certainly has to be in this. Okay, he's made it in there. Right, uh, we move on. We're gonna we're gonna head. Well, I was gonna say head northeast, but there was just a player who played northeast. Uh, this is the one that I'm like, I'm really surprised that this player is in here. Why is Paul Merson in your eleven? He's just so good. You know, when we when we're kids, the way that he used to play football is the way that I wish I could have played football. Like he, if you're ever bored on the internet, not now. Don't say you. Don't try and be funny. Not now. But if you are ever bored on the internet, if you if you go uh, put in Paul Merson chips, just watch the goals that he can <laughs> score. Mate, yeah. it was amazing. It was a, it was an amazing. You know, certain players they they're not seen as being good players because of the people that they are today. They see like I don't know another example and nearly made my list would be Matt Letizia. Matt Letizia and Paul Merson were remarkable football players, but because mm. of who they are today and the way that they're the seen, shine does go, doesn't it? The shine's gone a bit, mm. but like Matt Letizia. Is he, I think, the only player to have ever had in, in the goal of the month competition. Not only has he had two in the same month, but he had two from the same game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was genuinely, insane. genuinely yeah. like the, the variety of goals and the and the, the glorious goals that Matt Letizia would score were unbelievable. And Paul Merson was also a brilliant player. I used to love watching him play. He had really long hair, marauding down the wing. My cousin, a lot of, I'm from North London. A lot of my family are Arsenal fans. My cousin, I remember, he had the JVC shirt with Merson on the back. And do you know another thing, James? I mean, it's kind of bit Merson a little bit. But there was a celebration. You know how I said something sticks with you? Yeah. The Trevor Sinclair goal stuck with me. Do you know a celebration that stuck with me that I nicked? Do you remember <laughs> Paul one. Merson went, yeah, drinking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, I used to do it. Age I used yeah. to do it. I didn't yeah. really know what it meant. <laughs> but Paul Merson won the cup. Didn't they beat Sheffield Wednesday in the cup? Yeah, they did in 1993. In the League Cup and the yeah. FA Cup, yeah. Yeah, they beat Sheffield Wednesday. Merson celebrating. Mm. He's doing that, like, let's get drunk celebration. Yeah, which I'm and, sure he did. Which I'm sure he did. But but I, I just thought that he played. He was such a good player, James. And he, like, I do know you know what? You know. No, he was, he was. And actually, my memories of him aren't really Arsenal, I'll be honest. They're, they're more sort of Portsmouth and, and Middlesbrough. It, it was later down the line. And he made it. Well, I think what highlights how good a player he was was that he made it into that year in... Um, World Cup 98 squad. 98. Off, off yeah, the back went... of a season with Middlesbrough in the in the championship at the yeah. time. How rare yeah. is that? That's really Absolutely. rare to see something like that happen. Apparently he moved there because of uh, the, the wages. And uh, so he went there for a longer contract and the wages were just unbelievable from, from Borough. And Wenger told him, because he got offered a contract to Arsenal, Wenger said to him that you will be earning more than Dennis Burkamp. And so he was like, See you later. Yeah, I'm off. So, See you yeah, later. Yeah. Uh, but do, yeah. do you know the and the other thing, characters, James. You know, like how, how I think that characters are being robbed. He was a real character. Yeah. Have you heard that story? Have you heard have you heard the game that you used to play with Paul Merson? No. Somehow, I don't know how this was allowed to happen. But Merson and Gaza were roommates. Right. And listen to this game that they used to play with each other. Right? You put you both put a thousand pounds, and me and you right, we play this game. We both sit in a room, we put a thousand pounds on the table. We have to drink red wine and mm. take a sleeping pill every half an hour and the last person awake can pick up the money and walk out <laughs> oh my god yeah like they had, they had a game in the morning <laughs> <laughs> Christ 
That's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, because they were both at Borough together. Both at Borough. Yeah, yeah. Both at Borough, yeah. Wow. Yeah. But, um, also, but I just, think, I, final thing it's is... It's just an era, man. Yeah, and it is. It, it like you have to take it with a pinch of salt, and it's it, you got to be careful with glorifying these these kind of things. Yeah. But it was a it was a very different time, and and his performances for Villa in a season where they got to about I think the turn of the year might have been top of the league. Uh, I can't remember. It might, I feel like it was two thousand something like that, and he he. They fell off a cliff after that, but it was due to his performances in, t- in attacking midfield. And then the same with Portsmouth. He got Portsmouth up as well. When he became that kind of Matt Letizia player instead of a, a winger, he was a very good player. And they talk about character. He actually had he had character as a footballer, if you know what I mean, on the pitch as much as uh, as yeah. off it. Uh, Trevor's gone then. So, yeah, look, let's... Uh, he's, uh, he's drinking, buddy. Let's go with uh, <laughs> Gazza's next. Gazza's on your list. Makes sense. I mean... Well, I- in talk, talking about characters and that, obviously, there is a nobody nobody really comparable. Uh, in terms of the way that he played the game, it was it was breathtaking what Paul Gascoigne could do with the ball. It was truly, truly amazing. I remember seeing a goal, actually, that he scored. I remember I used to love... Did you used to do that Football Italia in the mornings, oh, Sunday yeah. mornings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? There was a goal I remember Paul Gascoigne scored. And I used to try. I couldn't work out why I couldn't do it. James, I still can't work out. Maybe your viewers can help us dis- decipher this. He knocks the ball, right? He's wearing a mask. He's wearing a mask. Do you remember yeah, he wore a cheek, mask in he Italy? He his cheek, yeah. So Gazza's wearing a mask and he knocks the ball. He's running straight down the centre of the pitch. He knocks the ball straight. He doesn't do anything to the ball. No fancy step overs on. He doesn't do anything. It's just the way that he's moving his body. His hips, yeah. Just moving his hips, moving his body as he's running straight down the, through the, through the, through the centre of the pitch, coming, coming in on goal. Does it again? Goes around the keeper and scores. I was just like, wow! It's a really simple game. It's a mm. really simple, you know. When I'm trying to do stepovers and like, you know, that thing the where Rory you jump Shuffle. on it, pivot and pull it back, like you don't need to do any of that. Gaza was just moving his body in a, in a in a way that was kind of unrivaled and unseen at the time. And if it, the people that you know, the comparison with Grealish, I think sometimes it's due to that he's got a personality first of all. But yeah. I think another part of it is he, the way Grealish beats a man. It's not like. It's not like Pepe, for example, who goes step over, step over, step over, yeah, step yeah, over, yeah. step over, and hopes they get dizzy. Yeah. Um, he just moves his shoulders. I think we've all seen that with, with Jack Grealish. And that's, I think that's where the comparison with Gaza, for me, comes. Because that it was a very strange thing that he was able to do and, and continue to do. And if you look at the go- look at the performances maybe in Euro 96, I think it might be the Holland game. I think he's unbelievable in, in yeah. that game in terms of being strong on the ball and carrying the ball and then Rangers I think you know I know you love you love Glasgow Rangers and that game where they needed to beat Aberdeen and I think he might have, did he score a hat trick some of the goals from that again it's the same thing he's no, there's no step overs he's just a little bit too strong a little bit too clever and mate the, Colin Hendry you know the really? Colin Hendry Euro 96 goal oh, man. how many times did you try and do that in the playground to your mate yeah you would you would you, you would know. attempt it would, oh, over Hendry over Hendry Bang it past Andy Gorham. What an amazing goal. Like, that is a goal that lives forever. And then just to, just to typify, like, the icing on the cake, the iconic dentist chair celebration. Yeah. Which, you know, like, I think that's, that's literally that 15, 20 seconds is Gaza in a moment, yeah. isn't it? You know, that's yeah. everything you need to know is there in that, in that moment. Um, obviously, yeah. Obviously, so bittersweet to so you know, not bittersweet is the wrong word. I mean, it's, it's tragic, isn't it, to see... Where he, where he is as a as a person now, and I think, but that that fear and that vulnerability was just kind of oozed out of him from the start of his career to the end. But the context was just so different. You know, he's twenty three, he's okay, he's like, you know, he's just living life and having fun. But those as that ages, you see the the sort of struggles that he's got, gone on to have, which is so sad. Um, let's move on to another player who maybe you know nowhere near as good in my opinion as Gaza, but. In terms of big games and big moments, I understand why why he's on your list. Yeah, I, there is there are very few men that I love more than this man. I'm talking about Roberto Di Matteo. Mm. I mean, almost everything, almost all of my moments, my best moments from Chelsea ever, this man is involved with. We'll start at the first one. He arrived. We signed three very glamorous players in one summer. Frank Leboeuf. Roberto Di Matteo, Gianluca Vialli. The first one to score was Roberto Di Matteo. We played Middlesbrough. Uh, we played Middlesbrough at home, and in the 86th, 87th minute, Di Matteo scored, shot from distance. 
a Middlesbrough team, by the way, they had their own resurgence going on. They had Revanelli. Mm. So we had Viali. We had Viali. They had Revanelli. It was a bit of a like bit of a thing. Mm. Anyway, Di Matteo scores, sits down on the Stamford Bridge pitch at the shed end, puts his finger in the air. It's a celebration. I'm going to send you the picture. It's a celebration. I got onto the Chelsea pitch fairly recently, oh, wow. the last couple of years. And we recreated the celebration. Right, right. A recent celebration with Jesse Lingard, Declan Rice, and those players yeah. playing the band is, is yeah. you can see that's that's got to be fostered. I think we've got to like appreciate those characters that are back in the game now. And I think we're getting to a point now with the likes of, you know, James Madison and his interviews, Declan Rice with his interviews, Cody with his interviews. We're getting them back now. They're getting a little bit less scared, and they're able to kind of speak their mind a bit and have a bit of fun. And and that kind of moment there was first done. By Chelsea, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean that that was that's the celebration now for, for me. You know, when a Chelsea, if you score at Stamford Bridge, do that, and and it it will live forever. You know, generations of people will get on that pitch and and recreate that. You be LeBuff, I'll be Morris. You be, you know, it's it's that. So so that's Di Matteo's introduction, effectively. You then, I mean, we can do this rather briefly, but. You look at the fastest goal at Wembley up until Louis Saha, I think, scored against mm. Chelsea. Weirdly, but the seconds. fastest goal, the fastest goal against uh, the fastest goal at Wembley up up to a point, Roberto Di Matteo, sending us on our way to winning the FA Cup for the first time in 26 years. The last ever goal at Wembley, the old Wembley, Roberto Di Matteo against Aston Villa. Another moment, you know, making history. We won the last one. Chelsea won the last FA Cup at Wembley. We also won the first FA Cup at the new Wembley. Mm. These moments count. You're making history. Yeah. And Roberto Di Matteo scored the last ever goal at the old Wembley. What a moment that is. Fast forward, we then won the FA Cup and the European Cup when he was our manager, taking over from Andre Villas-Boas. Like a terrible season. He came in, steadied the ship, took us to our most successful season ever. This guy needs to have a statue built at Stamford Bridge. Yeah. And I think, look, you've spoken a lot about the kind of... Um the ruthlessness of, of Chelsea. And it's, you know, it's a lot of these things you only see as you kind of uh, look back on the list of play of managers that have kind of come and gone at different times. Some deserved it, some didn't deserve it. But how do you feel about, you know, a little bit later down the line, how do you feel about Di Matteo and, and him being left? Because as much as he kind of, he won those trophies, you know, if you want to be really cynical and cruel about it, he was slightly, you know, he was kind of underqualified for the, for the job. But then for him to get, kind of put to the side and put to the sword, that must have hurt. I think, I think when Roberto... De, look, I hate, I hate the way that Chelsea run. I hate it. I think that it's... I, there was a time when I was on board with it, but, you know, you have an epiphany moment and mine has come. Mm. And the way that Chelsea have mistreated so many good people is disgraceful. Roberto Di Matteo won Chelsea the FA Cup, which is a huge achievement in itself, by the way. Beating Liverpool in a final, beating Tottenham on the way to the final. Huge. Mm. won the FA Cup we then won the European Cup we beat Bayern Munich in Munich that, mate, like, that, that was without a defence without a defence do you know what I'm like like we didn't have a, we didn't have a, you know David Luiz to his credit played basically with one leg mm. John Terry was suspended uh, Ivanovic was suspended it was an amazing thing that, that Roberto Di Matteo oversaw the following season we're third in the league we finished third in our Champions League group they sacked him in the November. I mean, it's just disgusting, isn't it? It's disgusting. It's soulless. And whether you think it? It he was soulless. Under, it's soulless, yeah. yeah. And whether you think he was underqualified or not, the guy just won us the Champions League. Like you don't sack him. You won us the Champions League in May, and we sacked him in November. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing. I, I come back to this with the, you know, there are parallels to to Lampard for for me still, and I think that you know, we know, you know, you've said it, I've said it. We know Tuchel's a better manager. We know he's got more experience, but. That, but it's not, you, the, point. It's not yeah. the point. You know, you can't you can't point. give the job and then yeah. just take it. What take if you're giving it unfairly, you've got to let them. You've, I feel yeah. like you've got to let them ride it out a little bit, especially when they've got so, so much credit in the bank. So. Also, mate, the, like the point of the point of the Lampard thing, like the last the last thing that was relevant with with employing Frank Lampard was the Chelsea win on the weekend. Like it was mm. such a bigger project than that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but but the Di Matteo one also doesn't sit comfortably. Yeah, I mean, his, yeah, career kind of cruelly a triple leg break, I think it was, and it kind of Saint finished Gallen. up his career. Saint Gallen, Saint Gallen, yeah, and he's Swiss, isn't he? So I, I saw that. Mad, like. you remember that? Mad, see what I mean? Saint Gallen. How yeah. on earth do I know that? 
<laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I had yeah. to finish at 31, which kind of, yeah, sort of stopped yeah. his career, obviously, in its tracks a little bit. But like you say, big goals and big games. That's what it's about, really. So uh, we move on to our final two. And of course, it's always the exciting bit when you get to the to the strikers. And again, I think there's a, there's a really like, there's a romantic theme here. And, and it, it's amazing the link between Chelsea and Italian football and Italians. Um, and so as much as you've kind of got some of the players that have come in your team, there's a player that that is Serie A, that is Italian football in the in the 90s. And I, I think we should talk about him first. Uh, Roberto Baggio, what a player. Oh, I mean, I, I'm, I don't think that I could, I couldn't quite, I found it unfathomable watching Roberto Baggio when I was a kid. Mm. It's like, what is this guy doing? And even <laughs> watching him since, you know, if you watch his goals back, like the amount of goals he just like runs through a defence and round the keeper. Like the blokes put the ball into an empty net more than anyone else ever. Just always kind of beats everybody and scores. Uh, and he did it with such such pomp and circumstance and in such a beautiful way. Mm. Um, and he's he's a really interesting character as well. Like uh, he's, he's like bang into Buddhism and yeah. you know he's a very generous man and uh, you know into philanthropy. Um, he's a very interesting guy and. Yeah, I think I think the reason that he's in this list is partly and significantly because of who he is, but also because of what he represents. Roberto Baggio, you say Roberto Baggio is uh, Sunday morning football for me. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you know his time at Juventus. I think as well with him is that there are these players. Maybe you kind of put him in that Maradona mold, not as as uh, controversial, but players that. Players that, you know, maybe the playing, yes, Juventus obviously had an amazing career there, 141 games, 78 goals, but then moved to AC Milan and it didn't really work, didn't really work from there at all, which was which was a, a strange one. But I, what I loved about him was it was the Bologna move and it was the Brescia move. It was those at, sort of actually at the later end of his career where you still saw the highlights from Football Italia and it would always be, he scored another goal, he scored another goal. Yeah. Brescia. 2000 to 2004, 95 games, 45 goals. Bologna, one season, 30 games, 22 goals. Uh, yeah. And and going back maybe just a touch, uh, a touch more, that 1994 World Cup, that was, I remember being allowed to stay up to watch that game. Obviously, it was in America and it was so bad. Like the game itself was so, yeah. so bad. But he was, you know, he was the hero. He was the man. He dragged that team. And again, you know, we talk about Stuart Pearce. He was sort of the Stuart Pearce of, of of Italy because he kind of had that moment a little bit without getting the full glory of being able to, you know, win a World Cup or win a major tournament. He missed that penalty in 1994. Like, it couldn't have been crueler, a, a, a player missing it, to, to lose yeah. it. Um, and then in 1998, he had that season for, for Bologna, got himself back into the squad. And then I remember in World Cup 98, him being given the opportunity to take that penalty and I think it might have been a group game. To, get, to, to allow him to have that story arc to kind of come yeah. back round was really nice, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and like you say, you know, it would just, it represents a period of my life that I look back on very fondly. Mm. And a confusing, a confusing style of player, because if you think of forwards at the time, you had your Michael Owens, you had your, your Shearers, but he was sort of like a second striker, like playmaker. It was an Italian guy. thing, though. Do you remember? Because there was obviously him. There was, do you remember Signori? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, obviously, Del Piero kind of played that yeah. kind of way as well. So true. Um, yeah. But no, it wasn't what we it wasn't what we were used to. Like, you know, we were more used to like say brilliant players that I remember being like totally blown away by, say Robbie Fowler. Mm. But like oh, Ferdinand, God. Dion Dublin, yeah. Chris Sutton, big, sort of big guys, big strong. Whereas mm. I'm looking at Badger and I'm thinking, yeah, that's that's more me. You know, like <laughs> there's something. There's a lot more. There's a lot more me in Baggio <laughs> than there is in Noel Whelan, you know, sure. or whoever I was watching at the time. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think that's it, mate. That's where. That's where the thread is for you. You know, if you think yeah. about Chelsea, you think about the glamour of Chelsea. The glamour of Chelsea as an area as well. I think you that you encompass that a lot of the time. You love that element of glamour, and so it. it there's you can recognise that in yeah. you know these sexy Italian footballers yeah. playing football, yeah, yeah. like having an espresso. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me like if, if the choices are basically, am I going to talk about Gianfranco Zola or am I going to talk about Darren Huckabee? <laughs> you're only one say winner. Darren Huckabee. <laughs> <laughs> that's it man but that's it those leanings are I think that's what I'm really excited about this as a series is is the idea of like who's your 
who's your guy? Who's your type of player? Because actually, when I start to think about it for myself, I, there is something in like the people that I aspire to be or to kind of have the same uh, DNA to, do you know what I mean? The same substance yeah. of in the players that I like and everyone's different. And, and you can see this in your team, mate. I love it. I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, and let's finish <laughs> off with a perfect one to finish off with, mate. Who's your yeah. final player? Oh, it's Gianfranco Zola. Uh, I'd never seen anybody do with the football what this man could do. Uh, he came into a Chelsea team. We didn't really know what to expect. It's about five million quid. And he totally lit up the Premier League. Uh, he, he, for me, is a Premier League great. I think people overlook him slightly in that conversation. Mm. Uh, but I think he's genuinely a Premier League great. He's done things with, with the football that I don't think anybody who's ever played for Chelsea before or since could do. You know, I mean, the only one that... The person that is often compared to him is Eden Hazard. But for me, Gianfranco Zola was leaps and bounds over what Eden Hazard could achieve. Obviously, not in terms of silverware, but just, just, just in terms of how good he was on the ball. Um, and in, so just to top it all off, this doesn't happen often with great players and it certainly doesn't happen with great Chelsea players. But everyone, he's lovable, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I can't argue with this one. Do you know what I mean? He's like, like a I... good guy. Yeah. He's, a good, he's a good man. You know, he's a, he's, he's, he seems to play... The, he played the game with a smile on his face. Uh, he did the honourable thing. He went... You know, when Abramovich came... He left Chelsea when Abramovich arrived. Yeah. Abramovich said, look, stay, man. I'll, I'll pay. I'll keep it. Whatever you need, you can stay. Mm. Uh, money's no longer an issue. Whatever you want, we can do. He'd already agreed to go back to, I think it was Cal- Cagliari, his former team, I think. Yes, yeah, that's head. where he went. He did, yeah, for two more um, He went back to, he'd arranged, he'd agreed to go back to Cagliari and he honoured it. So Abramovich said, stay, I'll pay you, you play in the Premier League, did all, all the obvious. Mm. Uh, Chelsea, you know, there's a revolution going on at the club. You might want to be part of this. And he's like, do you know what I do? But I've told Cagliari I'm going back and I'm a man of my word, so I'm off. And, and I rate that so highly. Yeah, and actually probably would have been a tougher decision because I think he there were some bumps in the road here. And I was looking at uh, looking at his numbers. Actually, his goals, 229 games for Chelsea. It's a lot. Um, but only 60 goals, which I was quite surprised by. Um, but then I thought about it a little bit more. And um, and sorry, first of all, that he had that final season when he was sort of 36, I want to say. Maybe, mm. maybe younger. Now, that final year at Chelsea, he just sort of came back and it was almost like the sort of swan song season where, you know, scores that goal against Norwich, but he was just brilliant full stop. Like he kind of found a new gear somehow, um, maybe playing with better players, I don't know. But there was a period, this is what I did want to talk about, was he didn't start that Cup Winners' Cup final against Stuttgart. And it was a came very on weird... It, he came on and won it, but it, I remember came watching that game and thinking it was a very weird time because you were kind of, you know, this player that came on the scene and was just frighteningly good. And then... All of a sudden, he couldn't get himself in the team. What are your memories of that? I, I can't really, I can't really remember it. I, I, I can't remember the specifics as to why, but that final is the Gianfranco Zola final. He scored with his first touch, didn't he? Mm. Yeah, Dennis Wise him puts him in. Half, he half, amazing assist from Dennis Wise. That is a perfect example of people overlooking Dennis Wise's football ability. Dennis Wise with a beautiful lobbed ball over the top. And Zola runs on, half volleys it, right foot into the opposite corner. With first touch of the ball. I've got the um, team in front of me now. So, De, uh, Flo. De Hoy in goal, Granville left back, Dubry, LeBeuf and Clark right back. Petrescu right wing again. Dennis Wise, Poyet, Di Matteo on the left. Flo and Viali. I think this might have been a season where Viali, who had struggled and not... He was on the bench for that um, 97... Uh, FA Cup final which if you think the season before I think he was playing in the Champions League final for Juventus yeah. is insane in itself but um, but then this year after I think he started to, he started to find his form a little bit and it was uh, yeah it was Gianfranco Zolo who came on 71st minute didn't start that game amazing no no that is weird that he didn't start I mean look there, there could have been a tactics thing you know flow up there leads the line creates a bit of space wears out the defenders you bring on Zolo and they're and they're knackered perhaps it's tactical brilliance mm. perhaps it was a huge oversight but like if, if everybody's fit I can't see a world where Gianfranco Zola doesn't start for Chelsea mm. in any game ever let alone a, you know a final when he's in his peak yeah um, uh, but he he is he was the first of of the like you know like the true elite to arrive he was he was the one then we suddenly and, and everything changed 
Mm. I suppose it's only come back. You know the way Fernandez arrived at Manchester United and it all elevated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what that's what Zola did. And I think, we, despite Burkamp getting to Arsenal earlier, I think Zola had a, a an earlier impact. I think it felt like with with Burkamp for Arsenal, it was more that it was the ninety seven ninety eight season where he was really like, wow, this guy's on a different level. But Zola, it was the year before, you know, goals in that quarterfinal against Wimbledon in the FA Cup. I remember yeah. that. I think a great goal oh, that against goal, Man mate, United that goal. as well. That goal, oh my God, that goal at Highbury, I was at that game, that goal at Highbury in front of the North Bank in the yellow kit. I mean, was it Chris Perry? Yeah. Who was it? Whoever it was, <laughs> that turn. Again, you've just you've just not seen things. I'd never seen things like that. Mm. You know, to, to, their, to as much as we love them, Monstein's not doing that. Mm. Like a turn like that and then a finish with your, your wrong foot effectively. Yeah, an yeah. Amazing, you know, an amazing goal. And even, you know, that year before the second goal, which, I mean, it's lovely, isn't it? Eddie Newton. I think that's almost, you know, there's another moment in it. That second goal, if you watch back the goal of 97, um, Ed, there's a ball from Dan Petrescu. You know, it's a three, it's almost three eras of Chelsea there, yeah. three elements of Chelsea. Because, you know, every team wants their players from their neck of the woods. Eddie Newton, obviously, yeah. is that. But you have a cross from Dan Petrescu. Who, who actually, if you watch it, because I saw this guy this morning, you see the cross from Dan Petrescu on a certain angle and he just stands there and watches it like this. It's amazing. Yeah. And then Zola, who on the byline, does back this back heel, back, he? back heel flick, which again, I don't think any other players are even thinking about doing those kind of yeah. thing, but he does it nonchalantly. And then Eddie Newton just bundles it in his on a plate. Yeah, bundles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, basically Eddie Newton, the defender and the ball all end up in the net. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, that was... That's Chelsea, you know, that's, yeah. and, and I think that's the final thing I would say about uh, Gianfranco Zola is do, you know, you have your, your Dennis Wises, your Mr. You know, your, your Mr. Yeah. Chelsea's, the English version, but I think you have a few of these Italian versions as well. And I think he is, yeah. he's the one, isn't he? Yeah. Zola out of those yeah. guys. Oh. Um, yeah. Final question. And I didn't want, I wanted this to be the one that kind of rises from the gut a little bit. Um, so I didn't ask you about this, but I'm going to ask you it now. Who, who is your manager for this team? Well, do you know who I'm going to do? It's going to be a little bit, it's, it's going to be sentimental, but Viali is very nearly in the team. Mm. And, and the fact that he's, he's only just not made it onto the team, I think I'm going to put him, I'm going to put him as the manager. Because he was, he, I think Chelsea won three trophies in that season with, with uh, Viali. And his first game, this will do it in, uh, on its own. The uh, if I got it right, the Ali's first game in charge was a replay, not a replay, uh, a second leg against Arsenal at Stamford Bridge. We'd lost the way. Manager change. The Ali's player manager. We play Arsenal at Stamford Bridge, and we beat them. We knock them out, and we win the cup. We beat them three one. Some of the goals, Roberto Di Matteo that night. In James, look it up, right? Roberto Di Matteo <laughs> scores a goal. It's still moving now if there's no net there. Really? It, he, he rockets it home, yeah. Um, and that, that that was one of the greatest nights at Stamford Bridge I think I've ever had. So Viali, because I love him so much, was nearly in the team. But I'm going to make him manager, I think. Okay. With, a, with a discreet, gentle uh, homage to uh, Carlo Ancelotti because I love him so much. Uh, Carlo, maybe Carlo, assistant manager. You can let Carlo, is, yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. Uh, right, mate, Rory, I loved it. Love chatting with you I about it. I loved it. it. Thank you so much. It's been an honour to be on here, James. Mate, my pleasure to have you on. Guys, if you have not subscribed to Rory, go and do it. Do it right now. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, then please do consider subscribing as well if you enjoy the content on here. Maybe check out another few more. And if you do like them, click the button. It doesn't cost you anything. Hit the like button on this video as well. And let me know some of your memories in the comments below. But also, tell me who you want to be on Dream Teams. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.